Kia ora Heidi Mai, and welcome along to Showy Ovaries, a podcast where I, intrepid, roving, investigative performer, Penny Ashton, pick apart the unpredictabilities of the human reproductive system as it gets shown the red card and is sent off the pitch forever. See, I do know something about sport. A quick reminder, as always, that I am not a doctor, though I was in the A cricket team briefly. But cricket balls are very hard and move quite fast, so I decided to quit that nonsense before I was hospitalised with concussion. But if you feel the need to talk to someone about being stumped by your maiden over I suggest you talk to a proper medical specialist who will hopefully diagnose your problems not using sports metaphors. My guest today is also not a doctor, but she has used a sports metaphor in recent advice to Christchurch mayoral candidates to play the ball and not the player, which is to say don't get personal in campaigns, debate the issues and not the personalities. And wouldn't it be nice if all politics worked like that? She was an MP for 23 years, is a one-eyed Cantabrian, Ototahi born and bred, and has been passionate about leading her electorates through some traumatic and triumphant times. From traveling to Japan to remember those lost in the Christchurch quakes, to the appalling mosque shootings, to celebrating new and historic buildings rising phoenix like from the earthquake ashes, to planting trees, she has worked tirelessly and often thanklessly for Christchurch. And she had invited me to her house for tea, but because I am in COVID isolation, I am in my parents' house. And she is in her house in Christchurch. So please give a warm ovary and welcome to the current mayor of Christchurch, Leanne Dalzell. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank Yoda. you, Penny. Lovely, <laughs> lovely introduction there. <laughs> It was a bit long, wasn't it? And uh, and it's interesting because obviously today the stadium, so speaking of sports metaphors, you have approved the stadium. So that's a really big day for Christchurch. It is a big day for the city and it sort of completes a jigsaw puzzle, the last piece in the jigsaw to finish off the blueprint that was imagined even before I became the mayor. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And it is, it's, you know, and that's a perfect example of the contentious nature of being the mayor. I just think it must be very frustrating that you will never be heaped in praise and, you know, somebody always hates what you do. So how do you deal with that? Well, you sort of have to have a relatively thick skin. I don't, so you just have to pretend to have a thick skin. Oh, right. Um, But I got a really nice little message today, just out of the blue, from someone I don't know, who sends me a message saying, just over 10 years ago, you stepped in to help us resolve a stalemate we had between Sarah and EQC. It was so awesome having a local MP who was motivated and not a complete (laughs) a-hole. And then she goes, thanks. And then she goes, oh, we no longer live in Christchurch, so don't read anything into this in a sincere, slightly belated thank you. And I said, thank you, that's very kind. She said, it's a bit tardy. And I said, never too late for kindness. How's that? Well, that's exactly true, isn't it? So a a lot of people do thank me. and, And they know that it hasn't been an easy time. No, I mean, especially because it's the the birthing pain or the rebirthing pains, obviously, there's so much mm. happening and so much that I guess a lot of that is bound into traumatic PTSD from people as well. Well, so there's been whole... multiple layers of it. I mean, you talked mm. of, in your intro about some of the issues that we've had to contend with, but, mm. you know, the reality is, is that it isn't just one and then we bounce back and then another one and then we bounce back. It's not like that. Mm. It's actually about, you know, sort of kind of absorbing and attempting to adjust. And each time something else has come to hit us, yeah. uh, we haven't quite recovered from the one that hit us before. So, you know, I had a very good experience of one of the guys that came over after the earthquakes. Now I can't remember his name, but he was a um, psychologist who'd been involved in the Victorian bushfires. And he talked about that phrase, running on empty, Mm. You, you you know that phrase. Mm-hmm. So um, it goes back to the days when there was a separate reserve tank from the petrol tank. And so if you ran out of petrol, you literally had to get out of the car, change over to the reserve tank, and then you could get to the petrol station. So running on empty was actually running on the reserve tank. Right. And uh, he made a very, very good point. He said when you refuel, when you fill up your petrol tank, because it's a, the reserve tank is a separate tank, you've got to fill that up separately. And I don't know that that advice got out and about as far as it should have, that when you're running on empty, you actually have to take 
extra time. You have to do other things in order to fill your reserve tank so that you can hit the next thing, not so much hit the ground running, but hit the ground at least with the capacity to draw on that reserve if you have to. Yeah, I mean, and personally, you've been going through that too because you had COVID and now you've had flu. <laughs> so yeah, like, you know, you don't have time to to regenerate as well. So I guess you might be looking forward a little bit to retiring from the mayoralty. I am very much looking forward to that, Penny. I mean, <laughs> there are so many aspects of the job that I adore. You know, mm. I love representing the city. I love speaking for the city. There have been many occasions when I've been invited to speak to overseas conferences. It's all on Zoom these days. Mm. But, you know, I've had the opportunity really to speak for the city. And I think Christchurch is on the world stage not all for the bad reasons, but actually for the way that we've responded to things. And, you know, we do need to have, you know, a mayor who's prepared to get out and say that and to understand why that's important. Mm, yeah, but yet you are looking to not doing that. No, I am not looking forward. I'm, I'm looking forward to. I'm not looking forward to to not being the mayor in that regard. But then I can always be the former mayor speaking on such matters. And uh, but I don't have to put up with any of the nonsense, um, yeah. which um, fortunately I didn't have to put up with today either. Yeah, right. No, which is good. Yeah. So mm. when is your last day as mayor? Is uh, the eighth of October. Oh, and it is it is the mayor. It oh, is okay. the mayor, not right. the mayoress. And the reason for that is is that the mayoress is the spouse. is the woman that's well, yeah, the spouse. I used to call my husband the mayoress, but um, he didn't really appreciate that that much. Yeah, I think that would be. Quite, I would. Yeah, I think that would be a delightful thing. Right. Okay. So it's mayor. Yeah, right. Mayor. Okay. And sorry. And when is that last day? Uh, it's on the eighth of October this year. And what do, exciting things have you got planned? Well, I think I'm going to take a bit of a break first. There are a few things that I've been invited to go to, even though I'm not going to be mayor. You know, there's a few events. The Aranui Community Trust, which is, uh, by the by, a, you know, a small um, community trust, but that's made such a huge difference to its neighbourhood. They've invited me to be a patron because I'm not going to be their mayor, and they've invited me to be at the opening of their firm family day, which they have every year. So, so I'll be going to that. But so it, essentially, just taking some time out, chilling. I think is yeah. in order. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe right. see some good comedy shows, Kenny. Oh, I might have some here. You could go and see. You could maybe see my show at the Court Theatre next year, Sense and Sensibility. Excellent. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I've got a longer introduction for you now, all about your marvellousness, and then we'll come back and get into the menopause aspect of the situation. So here we go. Leanne Audrey Dalzell was born on the 7th of June, so a recent happy birthday, 1960 in Christchurch and has lived here her whole life. She gained a law degree from Canterbury University and went on to work and be legal counsel for various trade unions. She was elected as the MP for Christchurch Central in 1990 and stayed an MP for the next 23 years, varying between the Labour list and also the electorate seat of Christchurch East. She has been Minister of Immigration, Senior Citizens, Commerce and Disability Issues, to name a few. Former MP Tim Barnett credits her training as a lawyer and having, quote, a bigger brain than most of us for her success. In 2013, Leanne ran for Mayor of Christchurch and was elected by a margin of 50,000 votes. She then threw herself into the often uplifting and sometimes combative role of Mayor, trying to please as many people as possible in a world where that isn't actually possible, especially without a rates increase. But she has been visible in her support for the Muslim community after the shootings, recently fronted up to some very angry constituents over the stink from the wastewater plant, is constantly judging budgets where no one is usually happy and is the ever smiling face of someone who clearly bloody loves Christchurch. So now after winning the mayoralty three times, Leanne has decided it's time for a new challenge, saying she hasn't got another campaign in here, especially with the passing of her lovely husband, Rob, who I met when they both came to my show with your BFF, Judith Tizard, and we all had a lovely time. And of course, you are the sister of my university buddy, Ro Anna. So again, after another epic introduction, please welcome Leanne. Hello. Okay. Hello again. Hello. So how do you feel about 32 years of public service sort of putting a bow on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just going to be a new phase of my life, shall we say. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a line in the sand, 8th oh, yeah, like October. A half, yeah. of your li- half of your life. 
<laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, it's been half of your life, right? And I and commiserations, obviously, I can understand, especially if you're saying that you don't have a thick skin. I think I read somewhere that he was your support that you came home to. Yeah. So, well, I mean, he also sort of kept me grounded. You know, like if I was fretting too much about something that somebody was writing on stuff or something, he'd say, don't read it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's easy. <laughs> My husband is exactly the same. But it's so, so easier said than done as well too though, right? Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. in that. It's yeah. good to have somebody 100% on your side, even how, you know, no matter how stupid you are though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, you were always very sensible and he backed that obviously. Yeah, so that is hard not to have that there. Yeah. So anyway, so the first question I've been asking everybody is what has your relationship with your body been like in your life and what journey has that been on? It hasn't been a good one, Penny. Oh, honey, really? (laughs) I know, I know. I've had uh, a constant battle with weight gain and weight loss, so I don't know whether you've heard that from others. but Maybe um, one or two people, yes. It has been a constant. I do blame my father for this. Um, Okay. There was a moment in time where he said, your mother and your brother, the sort of the thoroughbreds of the family, and he said, um, we're, the, we're, the, we're the draft horses. <laughs> wow. The image of me being a draft horse alongside my father, you know, probably I'm sure that added to my woes and dealing with what I felt was a bad body image. <laughs> yep, yeah. Fathers are good for that sort of thing at times, yeah. And my father often judges any – the first thing he says about someone is like, oh, her, you know, she's got a good figure and all this sort of stuff. Like that's one of the most defining things features of them which can be frustrating yeah yeah I think it was more more reinforcing the fact that I didn't have any control over what I looked like that I was you know my brother could eat anything he liked he had hollow legs yeah and I had to be a lot more careful so I think it was probably a reinforcing statement more than anything else but no I don't really blame dad at all I, the truth is is that I haven't had a particularly good body image and the funny thing is is that you know I was just reflecting on social media these days you know would I be running for public office for the first time in this set of elections if I'd never run before no way and I don't think that my body image would have survived the internet either you know it just didn't exist uh when I were young yeah. so yeah that is a shame and oh I had a really good question then that I was going to ask and it's gone this is funny because this is the first interview I have done with COVID uh and I am starting to forget some things so I'll just put that out there now uh but I was going to ask you a question you were talking about that with body image and uh yeah, wow, this is interesting because I haven't ever blanked like this very much doing this until yeah, now. Yeah, but I blank all the time now, so I don't right. know whether it is kind of, yeah. you know, I've always just blamed the age thing, but um, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Okay. Now, how did that manifest itself and, you know, how you felt yourself about in your teenage years and things like that? Really trying to diet um, right. and, you know, diets are not known to be particularly successful. Nope. And, you'd sit, well, I would. I've stopped projecting. I go I keep going you, you, you when, when I mean me, 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 me. Is that you end up, well, I ended up sort of binge dieting and then I'd binge eat and then I'd feel guilty about binge eating and then I'd, eat more you know so it was just a never-ending cycle of yeah just not coping with uh with how I felt that I looked when did that resolve did it ever resolve itself or well no not entirely except that I've I've become more conditioned to the fact that you know I'm as long as I'm within a reasonable range I'm comfortable so I don't do the binging either which way or anything like that anymore so that's good yeah I mean and it's so like everybody it's when I think of you it never once in my life have I thought oh she's somebody that clearly has to worry about what she eats you know but you you hear that and you don't care because it's what you think but Mm. yeah and it's it's just crazy to me how insidious that is it's particularly it is insidious yeah Yeah. it is Absolutely insidious. So, and did you have many partners and things like that that made you feel better about, or did that not count? Or no, well, um, you know, we all had sort of girlfriends and boyfriends when we're in our, you know, sort of later teens. 
heading into our 20s. But uh, no, I mean, I, I never felt under any particular pressure from anyone that I ended up in a relationship with. I never felt any pressure to be anything other than what I was. Great. Fabulous. Right. And you, and so when, how old were you when you became an MP? I was only 30 years old. 30 and years look, I old. hear some people, you know, like the, I mean, I know that um, I think Marilyn Waring was in Parliament at 23 or something. It was like Chloe Swarbrick. Look at her. Yeah, very mm. young. Mm. But, you know, to be honest, I sort of look back at a 30 year old me and I'm kind of aghast, you know, that, um, but, but, you know, in many respects, the advantage that I had was um, going into the biggest defeat that Labour had ever suffered in a general election, uh, which meant that we were on the opposition benches. But because it was such a landslide to the National Party, um, and this is pre-MMP, there were only about 29 of us, I think, wow. in Parliament for the Labour Party, and then... Jim Anderson was the new Labour MP and the rest were all national. And I remember Mike Moore saying when we're going to be voting in the first no confidence vote in the government, he said, they'll all laugh at us the first time that we do it, but then it will be done. So just hold your head up high and vote with confidence. And, you know, back in those days, that meant that we had incredible opportunities because there were so few of us that we got to speak on many different pieces of legislation. And I got to know a lot too, you know, like a lot about how Parliament operates and a lot how the standing orders work and things like that. So it probably is better from a learning perspective at a young age to go into opposition into rather opposition. than in government. Yeah. And would you say expectations were low as well? Um, expectations because of the number. We weren't going to be changing any of the results. But what yeah. I found was that if you went to see a minister back in those days, I, I think this changed over time. But back in those days, you know, I remember going to see Lockwood Smith and going to see Doug Graham over constituency matters, and they listened. In one instance, Doug Graham agreed to make a change to a supplementary order paper on a bill that was already before the House in order to meet one of the issues that I'd brought for him brought to him from a constituent. And Lockwood Smith had agreed to make some amendments to some of the changes they were bringing in in the early 90s as part of that mother of all budgets of Ruth Richardson's. Mm -hmm. And even the Prime Minister then, Jim Bolger, he took on board some of the issues I was raising around problem gambling. And that oversight moved into the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. So I found that even though you're an opposition MP in a very small caucus within the Parliament, if you had a case to be made and took it to the relevant ministers, they were generally willing to listen at least. And do you think that doesn't happen now? Well, I don't know. It's hard to tell. I mean, I've been out of there now for nine years, but I felt that there was a general shift in the sort of the character of the environment before I left. And do you think that's, you mean into that much more combative, sort of instantly yeah. opposite, whatever they do, they are the opposition, so they think the opposite way, that sort of thing? There's an element of that, you know. Um, Absolutely. I tried to get a sort of cross-party approach agreed to, maybe if I use one of the opposition MPs who actually then became a minister. So I worked very closely with Simon Power when I was the uh, Minister of Commerce and then he became the Minister of Commerce and I became the chair of the Commerce Select Committee. And that cooperative approach that we'd adopted, it applied both ways. And that to me is the, the epitome of excellence when it comes to Parliament working together to achieve good outcomes where they're, where they're shared, you know, their shared objectives. It's not the same when you're trying to talk about something like, I don't know, crimes or, you know, the, some, some of the criminal stuff. Because if we're going to address crime, in my view, you've got to start right right before babies are born. You know, I 100%. remember a yep. huge debate about a phrase that the Chief Justice had used at the time about 
blameless babes, but th- she was talking about the reality that so much has been fixed before the baby's even born. And then, of course, those first three years of a baby's life, so integral to joining all the synapses in the brain. And she talked about babies incubated in terror. And oh. I, I, I've never forgotten that. And I've oh. always felt that that is something that should be cross-party, that yeah. actually we should be addressing that together. Yeah. But I felt that there was a point in time where that just simply was not possible. And mm. maybe it was just the reality of going into one where where there was no way that we could vote our, our way through into an outcome, that none of them were sort of election issues. I suppose that could be another reason, but my perception was was that it got harder to work collaboratively across the house. And do you think there was just has social media contributed to that? I think social media has made a difference. So I always remind people that Facebook started in two thousand and four. The sharing or the retweeting part of the Twitter app that um, was two thousand and nine. And I think the sharing button on Facebook was 2012. So when you think about all of the things that have happened in that time and then what's happened since, yeah, yeah, it has made a huge difference. Right, okay. Yes. Right. Did you then know anything about menopause at all before it happened to you? I knew about it. I knew of it. And... um, My sister always used to tell this joke, which was um, menstruation, menopause, mental health. Why do all my problems start with men? Indeed. indeed. um, So I'd read a bit about it. There'd been a lot of stuff around on HRT and things like that. So I kind of knew about it. I had read quite a bit about hot flushes and people's redefining them or reclaiming them as power surges. My mother's um, is power surges, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. so, I, so I kind of knew about it and uh, so was prepared for it to happen. I was actually totally excited about not having periods, the periods ever again. <laughs> uh-huh. Did you have quite painful periods? or No, it wasn't so much that. It was just irritating and annoying. <laughs> right, okay. So is your sister older than you? No, I'm the oldest. You're uh, the oldest, right? Okay. Sister, um, I've got an older brother. Right. Okay. So, did your mother talk about her menopause or anything like that? No, no. Right. Does so that surprise I, you? I left home quite young, so ah. we wouldn't have been talking menopause back then. And I think by the time I got to menopause, you know, Mum was quite a bit older, and I, I hadn't really. No, I didn't discuss it with her then. So it wasn't something that we discussed earlier on. Did she talk reason. about how was she about talking about body stuff? And oh, did she- mum was great because the the big advantage of my mum is that she was a pharmacist. Oh so wow! So actually, I'd go home with a pile of questions from school. You know, what about this? What about that? What would you take for this? What? Did you- <laughs> I mean, mum never like you disclaimer around not being a doctor, but quite often I would and others would have questions about you know, what certain drugs were for, is this something you'd go and see a doctor about or is this, you know. And so mum was actually really, really good about those sorts of things. But yet still uh, kept all of that menopause stuff to herself. Well, I don't think that it didn't come up in conversation. I mean, it was bad enough talking to her about menstruation, I'm afraid. In what way? No, the worst thing was, was that I knew all about it. I knew what was going to happen. And then I discovered that, I had my first period after I'd cycled home from school. Oh, God. And so I went inside and I said, I've got my first period. And she said, you're a woman now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good on you, mum. <laughs> Do you remember how old you were? I would have been I would have been either 12 or 13. Yeah, I, th- I think 13. No, 13, because I was at the end of third form, which is – you know, late for some, but I was young for the beginning of third form. Yeah, as you've said, I've turned 13 in June. So, uh, you know, I have six months of being 12 in form three and then 
Sorry, right. they don't call it that anymore. Yeah, no, no, they don't. But that's what yeah. I was too. I don't understand yeah. these years. <laughs> they make no sense to me. Oh. Right. Okay. Okay. When you say you didn't want to talk about it, is it because it embarrassed you rather than her? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. No, no, <laughs> mum was great, you know. I mean, I was embarrassed to go and get my first bra. I just, oh. I cried. I actually cried in the back garden for over an hour before I was forced to go into town for a measure measuring up. Why do you think, what's that about? Body. I didn't right. want anyone looking at my body. Ugh. Oh, right. <laughs> Oh, that's that is sad. That's sad. That is right. Sad. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. How do you find buying bras now? I'm fine with buying bras. <laughs> I just take a deep breath. <laughs> I remember that through my COVID brain fog, a question I was going to ask you ages ago, which I thought was a great question, and then I forgot it. Which was, so if you were going to run for mayor again, so this is linking. Would would you do this podcast? Oh, yeah, why not? Oh, you would? No, I'm yeah. just curious because they're opening yourself up and all that sort of oh, stuff. Oh, no, no, no. This is different. This isn't, okay. this isn't political and, you know, I mean, if anyone wanted to make something of me talking about my sort of personal body shaming of myself, yeah. well, then so be it. But yeah. it's irrelevant. It's right. irrelevant to the ability to do one's um, – right. Or Job. undertake one's role. Yeah, no, because it's been interesting because there's been some like higher women in business who look at this like kryptonite. Like the last thing they want to do is show either what they perceive to be a weakness, but it isn't a weakness, you know, or particularly around menopause. But but it's always interesting that a person in your position doesn't care about. It. So it's so interesting who cares and who doesn't. Yeah. But it seems that business people that are making their way in a man's world, which you know, mayors can could be said to have been done, but yet we've quite a, quite a few female mayors, particularly in Christchurch now, haven't we? But um, anyway, so I just that was that was an interesting point. But I'll get my brain fog back into order. <laughs> <laughs> so so how did menopause start to manifest itself for you? Well, it was just the you know the stopping of the periods, but it was the hot flushes. So I definitely had those. I actually quite enjoyed them because, uh, especially in winter, it never bothered me. I didn't get any HRT or anything like that, and not because I felt that I shouldn't. Although I did think that at the time, because mm. um, that's what the literature that was saying at the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I didn't sort of seem to have any side effects. Although, having read your questions <laughs> ahead of this, yeah. um, I did realise that potentially I had some of the symptoms of menopause. That Such I'm, as? Well, well, let's just say that I wasn't that particularly interested in um, various activities that I thought were more tiredness, but <laughs> possibly were more. It was related. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Your poor husband. <laughs> <laughs> I know, which is probably why he was such a supporter of HRT. There you go. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> he was like, have you tried this drug? Right, okay. <laughs> you will see, this is the thing too, but I think it's part of this entrenched discourse that older women don't want to have sex. Oh, no. No, no, no. Don't think that for a minute. <laughs> well, no, I mean like, you know, that that's sort of built into people thinking rather than it's a menopause thing that you could possibly address if you wanted to, oh, it's just what happens. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, right, but right. <laughs> yeah, no, so I wasn't actually thinking that at the time. I was thinking I was more stressed and tired, mm. you know. Um, I mean, you've got a stressful yeah. job, let's be honest. Yeah, and then we had an earthquake and, you know, that was all around the same time. I was so, about to say, yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. when you got elected as mayor, was it? Or when you were an MP? Yeah, it was when I was uh, still an MP. I would have been 50 in my early 50s, so... That I turned 50 in 2010, just a few months before the first earthquake. Right. And I became the mayor in 2013, so sometime in that three-year period. In that whole time, right, um, yeah. But it was a very stressful time, and as I say, that's not easy to – catch up on stress. <laughs> and the other thing with menopause and just health in general is you're never quite sure which is the factor. Is it the stress from the earthquake? Is this menopause? You know, and just trying to figure all of that out can be quite difficult. Yeah. And yeah. plus Rob and I got married in 2010 as well. Oh, wow. Like after the quakes or just before? Uh, well, it must have been after the first one. Right, yeah. 2010. Yeah, 2010. Because we got married on the 11th of November. So that meant that our 11th wedding anniversary was 11, 11, 11. <laughs> That's right. not why I did it that time. But, right, okay. Um, yeah. 
Right. So that's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. So you feel that you, oh, you had a few things that you maybe didn't put down to menopause at the time, but it does sound like your menopause was not particularly arduous, would you say? No, no, it wasn't. And, you know, that's why I felt like I might be a boring contributor to your show um, (laughs) (laughs) because I don't have any horror stories to tell you. No, but that's good because, um, yeah. as I've said a few times now, I'm interested in all manner of menopauses so that people don't all think it's horrendous. <laughs> so yeah. It's good. And, and I haven't gone through it yet, so I like to hear stories like this myself because potentially it will be the same for me, right? Okay. And so, therefore, you wouldn't have thought felt that it affected your working life at all? No. No, no definitely great. not. And did you have some friends, though, that were being hit a bit harder by it? Yeah. So, um you know, it's not something that sort of came comes up in everyday conversation, but, um, you know, a, a couple of my friends didn't have such a good experience of it. But generally speaking, I mean, I probably haven't discussed it with that many before. So I'm right. glad that you're doing this because it is important that people know about these issues and are able to kind of explore some of these things before it happens. Yeah. So they're not mm. blindsided by it. That's, yeah, my, that's yeah. my whole MO, obviously. So it's interesting that you're – because, so you are in a group of friends that hasn't really talked about it very much. No, no. And, yeah, and, you know, you could take that to be it's just been relatively uneventful or maybe people haven't felt comfortable or – Or do you maybe think I haven't got many friends, but <laughs> – <laughs> Obviously not. But it's hard to fit social life in around being a mayor, is it not? It is hard. It is hard. But, yeah. um, no, it's not something that's come up. And I, I've got friends who are quite a bit older than I am too right. and they would have gone through it before I did and yeah it's more the friends that you've had for a while that you're more likely to have the conversation with yeah but yeah. we don't all live in the same city now anymore so yeah right mm. yeah are you still in touch with many people from parliament quite a few but um you know not that many yeah no I've got a very eclectic broad range of friends <laughs> right and you must be are you going to do some traveling now that you are a bit more footloose and fancy free Yeah, possibly. I mean, I'd like to. I mean, I I want to go over to the UK next year and I will spend a little bit of time traveling, but we'll just see how things play out pandemic wise as well. You know, I don't want to put myself at any particular risk. So yeah, like landing in the middle of some hotbed of more, even though New Zealand's pretty much a hotbed. Of COVID. It is at the moment, but it's not just COVID at the moment. It's the flu, the as, flu well, as well. And yeah. it's that pretty bad combination. There's a lot of people who are off work at the moment with one or the other. That's exactly right. My timeline is just crazy. It's just dominoes, basically. It's just one yeah. after the other. And a lot of them, like me, it's the first time. Like I've avoided, and I've been assiduous because I've I been. Know. I know. Yeah, you I've have. been trying to avoid. Um, I to stalk catch you on Facebook. I know this. Oh, I see. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've like I haven't eaten in a restaurant all year, so that's what I've been like. Right. So, but there is something pleasing to actually having caught it, and despite. Yeah going to hospital on the first day and passing out twice, uh, which I've never really done before, it hasn't been too bad. But, yes, talking to you and trying to exercise my brain. See, I'm trying to keep up with your enormous brain, Uh, and mine is, is lagging somewhat. But I do have a show in a week, so we'll see if I can do that, but we'll find out. Good. (laughs) <laughs> so now, was there, did you have any fun fact that you could uh, give us about your menopause or someone else's or anything in general? Well, I guess it's an internet one, and that is is that if you don't know much about a subject and you Google it, so if I didn't really know that much about menopause or didn't recognise a work like perimenopausal or whatever so it you was. You didn't know what that word was? No, I had to look it up. Wow, um, right. But when you Google for all of these things, <laughs> symptoms, et cetera, et cetera, the algorithms, the algorithms get you. And now now <laughs> everyone thinks that I'm much younger than I actually am. So <laughs> there you go. If you Google for menopause when you're much older than having had it, then um, – You can become young on the internet. I love that. (laughs) Every advertiser thinks that I'm of a certain age. (laughs) You're the first person that's ever articulated menopause as being for a younger women's game, which I particularly... (laughs) That's because I'm old, Penny. (laughs) Well, just older, slightly older. I mean, that's one thing that I've been astonished by when you think that, like, I am nearly 50, so I'm of this age where we've been historically so written off, and I remember being young and thinking of 50 as old. I mean, like, so, yeah, how are you finding that now that you're 62? Do you feel like what you used to perceive 62 as being? No, no, no. I mean, I I look in the mirror sometimes and I go, oh, my God. 
good. You look old. Don't stop it because you're not. And it's the same. I mean, it's the same with every age and stage. I, I look back on my life growing up with mum, for example, and mum looked old because she dressed old. You know, like, right. you know, when she was in her 40s, she'd be wearing, you know, a twin set or something dreadful <laughs> like that. But nowadays, you know, that people dress younger. Yeah. <laughs> so 40 is a very young mum, whereas I didn't have a very young mum, if you know what I mean. Right. I, mean, I okay. did. I did actually when I think about it because she was in her very early 20s when she had started to have (laughs) her many children. So it's all in the mind, absolutely. But I don't feel 62. I feel like 62 is the new 42. But then I wouldn't have had menopause already, so maybe it's the new 52. (laughs) Whatever. This is getting complicated. (laughs) It is. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah, like – I am definitely benefiting from years of accumulated knowledge, though, I will say. Let's call it wisdom. Uh, But, you know, just getting to that point where you know a lot more about certain things. And and for me, one of the biggest sort of surprising things I have found is realizing, excuse me, but that everyone is fucked up. Like everyone is fucked up. It's not just me. It's not just me with the insecurities, the imposter syndrome, all that sort of stuff. You just come to realize that everybody Have feels you got that like too. That. Oh my god! <laughs> it's just even hearing the words imposter syndrome gave me such. Oh, so it isn't just me. You know, knowing that that existed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you get? Do you feel like you're an imposter man? Absolutely, imposter- absolutely. But I'm getting out before they find out. <laughs> Excellent. You put on your cape and you fly out the window, right? Okay. Yeah. So that's what I mean. Everybody is so screwed up. And so all we can do is realize that and then just put your best foot forward and do what you can from there. Yeah. You've got to take that attitude, I think, because we are the sum of all of our lifetime's experiences and all of the the sort of cues that we've been given all our lives. Mm. And that will have impacted on different people in different ways, which is why we're not all the same. Thank exactly. goodness. Yeah. But it does mean that we have to kind of at some point say, ah, enough already. We're just going to kind of take control of that part of our lives that we can take control of and um, do the best that we can do. And Absolutely. that's all you can ask. Have you come up against much misogyny at all or just like entrenched sexism from dinosaurs or anything like that in these (laughs) roles? There's a little bit of it about, but I have to say that, um, you know, when when you look at some of the behaviour and ill-informed and and quite deliberate misinformation on the internet now and the misogyny that's growing through that platform. Yeah. You know, it's almost as if somebody said, oh, you've got permission not to be nice anymore. Mm. You've got permission to say what you like with no repercussions because no one knows who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we all know bullies who tend to be, operating on the basis of picking on people not their same size or hiding their identity. Hiding your identity has never been easier on an online environment, which is why I take no notice of the nonsense, but we'll have direct conversations with the people whose opinions I care about. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. there is it is more gendered, isn't it? It is definitely harsher and Ooh, more sexually absolutely. all of that towards There the is no question that, mm. you know, from a woman's perspective, it is much harder in those spaces. It seems that the anonymity emboldens men, well, not particularly good men, it emboldens, emboldens them in a way that they simply wouldn't they wouldn't have the capacity to even begin to imagine if they were exposed, exposed. for who they were. Which yeah. is why that, I can't remember her name, Sarah, is it Sarah yes. Templeton? Yes, Councillor Sarah Templeton. She's the most courageous woman politician that I've known for a long time mm. who took on a really delicate environment to go to the court and have revealed the name of the person who was harassing her online. And it was interesting, not one single word of any of the sort of kind of regrets that were expressed from those quarters indicated that they were sorry for what was said and done. 
it was that they were really disappointed that the person had chosen to hide their true identity. And I, I'm appalled by that. I think that the, the, the fact that of what he did and what he said, that was never apologised for. It was no. never, he was never held to count for Do you any mean from, of that. From the people from Young National, is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were regretful of the fact that he hid it's his identity. Anonymous, right. You go back and read all of the commentary that came from the National Party on that, and I'm mm. not being political. If, if it had been the other way around, I'd have said exactly the same thing. Yeah. No one said that what he did was unacceptable. They said that not showing his true identity was not acceptable. Yeah, well, yes, that was a spectacular own goal on the behalf of the Young National Party, et cetera, and just, and just, yeah, and it did, and I just thought she was amazing. And she just came out of it so well because she knew that this was a gendered attack and that to yeah. expose them would expose more people. I mean, I, I, do you think it's made any difference to the volume of hatred that's come through? I don't know. I think that it's made people a little bit more cautious about being caught. Yeah. But I don't know that it's made anyone less emboldened in terms of what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. You just sort of, I mean, I even have noticed it at times. And sometimes because it's so insidious, you don't notice it. Right. Yes. So big props to Councillor Sarah Templeton. Yeah. Councillor Sarah Templeton. Yeah. yeah she did a great job. And I think a lot of women around the country... Um, have been very grateful to her, mm. particularly those that are in public life and those who are contemplating it. So I, I don't want anyone for, to think that I'm in any way discouraging people from getting involved, but mm. I am saying you've got to protect yourself. You've got to make sure that you're surrounded by good people. You've also got to make sure that you don't take notice of the anonymous keyboard warriors yeah. who are nobody. Yeah, it's so interesting as women too. You're either too young and silly like Chloe and Golras. Look at them. They're too young. They don't know what they're doing. Or too old and haggard, you know, off you shuffle now, Annette King, you're too old, which is rubbish. You know, all this sort of stuff. And it is it is very frustrating that it's often around that with their ages and their genders, etc. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And of course, as it is Christchurch, I do know Sarah's sister. <laughs> right. Well, of course yeah. you do. <laughs> anyway, right. Okay. So is there anything else at all you thought you might want to say around menopause or anything? I don't think so. Should I? No. Nope. Said it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was very easy. Well, um, have a wonderful last couple of months as the mayor, and I look forward to reading about what you're going to do next. And we might actually meet up and have a wine next time, although you're not drinking, right? Well, I'm not drinking right now, but that's oh. because I'm focused on completing this particular role. So I will be having the odd wine in the future. Right. But we'll pop a champagne now. cork when we actually can yep. look at each other. And, and Some yeah. bubbles would be lovely. That sounds delightful. Well, okay, until then, thank you very much for your time and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, that was the very lovely outgoing Mayor of Christchurch, Leanne Dalzell, who was an absolute trooper as I kept meandering around topics and losing excellent trains of thought derailed by the COVID express. Not so much choo-choo as achoo. Hilarious. It's actually been the only time I have had any sort of brain fog, but then I haven't been pushing myself to do anything overly intellectual. But today I did this Wordle thing that actually has 32 different words and I managed to get them all, so I think I'm doing okay now. Though it did hurt my soul to listen back to that and see some holes in my questions, but also I was missing an outright statement of complete empathy around losing her best cheerleader and support in her husband. I feel bad I did not stress that, but rest assured. I will be sending her a message. It also made me sad thinking of the hatred she has been flung, knowing her skin isn't as thick as some might think. So, I doubt I have any raging trolls in my regular few hundred listeners. Don't go anywhere. But let's not forget, politicians are still people too. We can hold them to account over things like putrid stenches. But as she says, play the ball and not the player. And on that sporty note, I will see you next week, showy ovarians. I still haven't got anyone lined up yet, so what will happen? Who knows? Tune in next week to find out. Ciao, Ballers. Penny Ashton, back in Auckland and signing off.